pretty sure it's recording from the right channel. Okay, so, so now we got both of them recording, and I can start on the browser. <clears throat> All right, first thing first, um, I don't use D2L, I use Moodle. So for those of you who only know how to get to D2L, um, you have to adjust the URL to get to the website of this class. It's moodle.losrios.edu. Uh, many of you have taken my classes before. You know, that has not changed for those of you who have taken classes before from me. Okay. I'm not sure whether you can read it. Is it okay? It's moodle, M-O-O-D-L-E, dot losrios.edu. Um, I'm going to leave this on the whiteboard you know, so you guys can copy that anytime you want to. <clears throat> and if you just you know, type the URL, it's going to redirect you to the uh, secure uh, HTTP part of it, just to make sure that nobody can steal your secrets, such as your homework assignments and stuff like that. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so when you log in, you want to log in with your W and then the seven digit student ID and then your usual district password. Um, but since I am logging into my instructor account, I am going to use my other account name. Unless you are trying to add to this class, you're, you should have this class already um, existing in Moodle. So if you go to the My Courses part, okay, let me zoom out first. So what you normally would see is My Courses is here and CISP310 is right here for me. Um, unless you have taken, you're taking multiple classes from me or other people who uh, use Moodle, there should be only one item, okay? And once you click that link, you'll, get, you'll be into the CISP310 website itself, and it contains links to all the reading material, homework, and stuff like that, okay? So this is really, you, know, you, you really need to have access to Moodle to take this class. There's no official textbook, but there is an optional textbook for those, of pe those, for those people who would like to have a textbook. Um, this textbook is kind of interesting. It is available as a PDF file. Mm. <clears throat> and it's not too expensive. It's 21 bucks and 49 cents. I think it's, that's the, uh, the printed version, which is a paperback. Um, I believe it is also available as a PDF. So if you pay that money, you can also download the PDF. Um, I do not actually follow the ordering of the chapters in this book, but it does contain pretty much the same material, or you know, I should say you know, it's, it's a good complement if you want to get some additional material for this class. Once again, it is not required. I'm not teaching to this book, but you know, if you want any type of like secondary material um, for reference purposes, you know, this is a great book to, to have. Okay, and 22 bucks is not too much for a textbook. Well, you guys know that already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're not missing a zero here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing we need to do is to go over the syllabus because you know, unless you acknowledge all the different points in the syllabus, nothing is going to be visible to you. Okay, so I need to go over the syllabus and please ask questions if you have any questions about the syllabus. I can see four people have already done it. <coughs> it looks like a quiz, but it's not. Okay, it's really just a syllabus, but I want to make it so that you have to kind of acknowledge each point so that this way um, I know who has read it, at least it'll click on the links, and who has not. <coughs> okay. So the first section is just uh, the uh, information about this particular section. Um, should be no surprises whatsoever. And, um, oh, I think I forgot to change the section number in the description. <coughs> but the other one is actually correct. So this one is correct. This is section 12631. Is that right? Sounds about right? OK. But the time is correct, OK? this is an AM class because the fall class is always in the AM and then the spring class is always in the PM. <coughs> um, the exam, the final exam date, you might want to 
put this on your calendar right now. It is on December 13th, the Tuesday. And the start time is 8 a.m. and the end time is 10 a.m., okay? So it doesn't start at the same time as the class itself. It starts one hour before the usual lecture time. So keep that in mind for the final exam, okay? I have had people who come to the final exam at 9 o'clock, they go like, oh, I only got half the time remaining to get through the, ex the final exam. So make sure that you put it on your calendar. So are there any questions about the section itself? No, no questions? All right. I'm not going to talk about the SLO or the student learning outcome um, because, you know, we are going to talk about all of this stuff here. So there's no need for me to go over this you know, prior to the, the class itself. So my name is Tag, T-A-K, that's my first name, and my last name is Aoyoung, it spells A-U-Y-E-U-N-G, which is a Cantonese approximation, or it's an uh, English approximation, approximation of a Cantonese last name. Um, it's a hyperlink for those of you who want to kind of look up my last name and see what is the origin of that last name. <coughs> it really doesn't matter, right? I mean, but I found it, go like, hey, that's kind of cool, I'll put a hyperlink there. Um, my email address is drtag2016fall at gmail.com. I use a new one every semester. My office phone number is 916-484-8250. And my office has changed, okay? I know many of you have my classes before, and I had office number seven in Liberal Arts 133. Now it is number three. So it's actually a little bit bigger. I can accommodate a few students in the office at the same time. Yeah, it's just uh, one uh, aisle on the other side. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you still have your uh, graveyard of computers in there? Um, yeah, I still have a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, there are no ghost Pokemon in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until Gen 4 for Rotom. Oh. <laughs> My office hour is uh, Monday all the way to Friday from 8, o from 8 to 9 a.m., which is really convenient for this class because it's right before this lecture. So if you need to talk to me for whatever reason, clear up concepts and whatnot, you'll just uh, come to campus a little bit early and stop by my office. Okay? Any questions up to this point? Okay, nothing. All right. Moving on to uh, presentation slash delivery methods. A lot of this stuff, you know, is mandatory, so I was told that I have to put this stuff in my syllabus. Um, so I would use a variety of ways to deliver the content of this class. Um, I would say reading material is the majority, and then there will be some interactive activities. I'm reformatting my reading material to make them more interactive, so that after reading a section, it will give you a little question and you know so that it's more interactive and you can kind of double check whether you understand the concept or not because of the question but those activities do not count to your final grade it's really just for reading the material in in a more interactive way instead of like oh, okay here's like 26 pages of stuff to dig through all right um, this section is REC, RSI, you know, REC stands for Regular Effective Contact, and RSI, which is about the same thing, is Regular Substantive, substantive Interaction, okay. <clears throat> this is here because of accreditation. Um, how many people are taking or have taken an online class, like a 100% online class, okay? And have you encountered the you know, cases where um, there's no interaction with any human, okay? You start a class, you do all the homework assignments, everything gets graded automatically. At the end of the semester, you get a grade and that's it, okay? Occasionally, you have classes like that, right? So those classes are lacking regular effective contact, which is basically the instructor either in usually initiating a communication and say, oh, just a quick reminder, there's a quiz next week, okay? or you know, a comment like, okay, I have graded everything, uh, like the previous homework assignment. I have noticed that a lot of people have a confusion of these two concepts. Here's a clarification, blah, 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 blah. So there's more interaction. Um, it's really difficult not to have REC, RSI in a 100% face-to-face class like this one 
To do that, I would have to turn my back like this <laughs> and just talk to the whiteboard the entire time, despite you guys screaming and say, Tech, we got questions. I go like, la, 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 la. You know? <laughs> <laughs> then I would be lacking REC, RSI. Okay? So this section is not really that important, except for the fact that I do want to encourage people to use my office hours because it's right before this class and it's usually underutilized. Um, the lab time is right after this class. That's usually a time where you can do homework assignments, but I also use that time to demonstrate certain things because I found out that uh, if I do all the demonstration using the lecture time, I run out of lecture time for actual topics. So I'm going to relocate some of the time for demonstration to the lab time. <clears throat> I don't have online office hours because you know I have only face-to-face, on-campus, physical office hours, so that does not apply. Um, I have not turned on the forums in Moodle for this class because this is a face-to-face -face class. On the other hand, if you guys feel like, well, since you know we won't have any actual class meetings from thir after Thursday until Tuesday, so we have about four days of no meeting time, and you feel that, okay, I want to be able to use a forum to talk to the professor or talk to other students, I can enable that, okay? It's not a problem. Um, on Moodle, you can also message me, but the messaging is kind of limited. Um, you don't really have much uh, formatting to choose from. You cannot attach files and stuff like that. So it's only good for sending simple messages, but not anything that is complicated. Uh, email and phone, usual ways to contact me. And time frame policy basically says I have one day to respond to your email. Um, and over the weekend, the turnaround time is 48 hours. Um, usually it's not that long, but sometimes it can be that long. Uh, etiquette policy, really common sense stuff. I just want to make sure that uh, on the forums or in the classroom, um, the, you know, everything remains, um, you know, just civilized. Um, and uh, just uh, make sure everybody feels safe, you know, to talk about stuff in the classroom and not feel uh, discriminated or harassed or stuff like that, or bullied in this case. So, are there any questions about these particular topics? Mostly just common sense stuff, but I do have to write it out and just have everything you know, spelled out. No questions? All right, okay. So moving on, first day of class. I will draw people who do not come here on the first day of class, so I think you guys don't have anything to worry about. Unless you're a virtual projection that is <laughs> just uh, somehow appearing here, you know, visually, optically, but not actually physically. Because an optical illusion won't be able to Thank sign you. on the row sheet. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm going to pass the row sheet here. Go ahead. <coughs> Okay, accommodations. So for people, you know, uh, for disabled students, yes, so go ahead. I want to in the class. Um, if you're adding to the class, you know, on the second page, there, there's some empty space. Oh, okay. So just write your name on the second page and initial on the right, in the right column for the page there. Oh, okay. Yep. How can, any idea how many people you think you'll be able to take from your waitlist? Uh, well, the waitlist has 16 on it, and the class size is 30 something. So I think I'll accommodate as many students as in my 440 class because these two classes should have about the same size. So I'm not sure why they choose a smaller classroom for this one. So um, we'll, we'll take a look at the row sheet you know, after everybody has signed in. But if you're trying to add to the class, you know, just go ahead and add your name at the end of the list. If you don't find your name on the wait list, just keep adding you know, to the end of the list. <coughs> So getting back to accommodations, uh, for people who need accommodations from the DSPS, um, go ahead and contact them first, okay, because I cannot provide or get uh, accommodation help. Um, so those are the people who can do that. Um, if you need uh, special accommodations in the exams and stuff like that, I also need a piece of paper from the DSPS office before I can uh, provide the accommodation. Excessive absences, okay, so this is a long section, but the bottom line is really quite simple. The bottom line is one class, one class meeting, 
which is 80 minutes, is approximately 2.5% of the entire semester. And excessive absence means 6 or 6% 6 or more absences compared to the entire duration of the semester. So everything basically boils down to uh, the first unexcused absence is fine. The second unexcused absence is fine as well. The third one is not. So you know you can so every basically everybody has up to two unexcused absences in this class. Okay? All right. And anyone with six percent or more absences, you know, can be dropped. But there are absences that are that must be excused, and those are the sickness or you know health related absences with verification, okay, with some kind of documentation. Uh, those they they must be excused, okay. And absences that are not excused, that not at least not mandatorily excused, are religious holidays, family occasions, job interviews work-related issues, car transportation problems, and so on, okay? So the only thing that has to be excused are verified sickness, okay? That's it. Any questions? Now, I understand things do happen in life because, you know, they happen to me as well. So, you know, that's what those two unexcused absences are for, okay? You know, if you have an emergency that is not sickness-related, use one of those, okay? Now, on the other hand, if you have like some really, you know, bad situation, you know, you can explain that to me, okay? You know, so I can choose whether to ex uh, excuse, you know, some of the absences or not. Is that okay? All right, okay. Uh, late policy is really simple. Unless it is excused, like, you know, because somebody is sick and could not make it to class, or could not work on the homework assignment, there's nothing can be turned in late, okay? So you have to turn in everything on time in order to get the credit. Um, if, you are go, if you are sick, okay, and you cannot, uh, cannot get to an exam, we are, we, we're gonna have like three exams, you know, two midterms and one final exam. So please let me know as soon as possible. I understand that when you're really sick, you can't really get up to type an email or call me, okay? But if you can ask somebody else to do it, you know, that would be really helpful, especially for the midterms, because I usually go over the answers in the following class. But if I knew that somebody could not make it because of sickness, then I would defer the discussion of the solution so that that person can take the same test, okay? So just let me know as soon as possible. Last uh, semester, I had someone, you know, telling me that that person was sick after a week, uh, one week after the exam. So that made it, uh, that, that was a really kind of difficult situation. <clears throat> the next slide talks about academic dishonesty or cheating. Um, so basically, it is, um, I classify that as, you know, when a student attempt to so po show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, or skill beyond the level of the student or help somebody achieve the same results, okay? That's it, okay? You know, doing something to attempt to show a possession of a knowledge, a level of competency, knowledge, or skill beyond the level, okay? The other way to look at this is to look at it from the integrity's perspective. Um, which basically means the grade of a particular assessment, like a test, assignment, or homework assignment, and stuff like that, of a particular student should reflect the academic performance of the student and only of the student who turn in the work, okay? Uh, in this class, I encourage group discussion, but n there's no group work to turn in. So homework is supposed to be individual, midterms are individual, the final exam is individual as well. Now, if you guys want to kind of talk about the concepts, you know, just to clear up you know, some of the confusions and stuff like that, that's perfectly fine. In fact, it is encouraged, okay? But when it comes to working on stuff that I'm gonna grade, it is supposed to be individual work. And it has to be done at the time that is approved or scheduled, and it has to follow all the rules of the assessment <clears throat> and only using the resources allowed for that particular assessment. 
Now, I can tell you pretty much right away, you know, I don't see any reason I would change that policy is for the midterms and also also for the final exam, it's going to be paper-based because, you know, there's, there are too many people here. The lab cannot possibly accommodate the entire class. So it's going to be paper-based, um, but the exam is going to be open book, open notes. Okay? You can, you can purchase the optional textbook, bring it with you. You can uh, bring your own class notes that you have that you're taking during class. Um, you can take screenshots of the of the videos and bring that with you. Uh, you can print out all the sample programs that I work on during class and bring that with you. Okay, so there's no real limitation except for physical limitations on your desk and stuff like that of how much stuff you can bring with you to the exams. Okay, um, the only requirement is two. Oh, there are two requirements. One. Uh, no electronic uh, medium you know, during the exams. So cell phones, tablets, you know, and laptop computers cannot be used during the exam. Um, and two, um, you cannot exchange resources during the test with other students. Okay, so if you guys study as a group, you come up with, a, with you know, like some material that you would like to use during the exam, make copies so that each person has his or her own copy. Okay, all right? So, but, uh, but basically, uh, there's no need to memorize anything, okay? You can bring anything that, is, that you think you need in order to remember something. This class is never about remembering anything. It's all about understanding and applying knowledge. All right. So the litmus, litmus test of whether cheating has occurred or not is like this. So let's say there's one particular assessment called X. And I suspect a particular person, you know, is copying the answer of somebody else. So what I, the, the limit test is to uh, derive or make a second test, let's call that Y, which, is, uh, which has about the same difficulty level and the same scope, okay? So I can ask a student to take the test again, you know, but it's an alternate version. So assuming these two tests are about the same in terms of difficulty level and the scope, um, a student should score about the same, especially if the time is about the same. Um, I sometimes cannot really gauge the difficulty level of the questions. So if that is really an issue, like somebody said, but this test is really a lot harder, or it's a lot easier, and that's why I get a better score and stuff like that, then I can just give the second test to some other students, and then just you know, statistically look at how the, the score of the first and the second test relate or correlate and then see if you know there's anything that's out of the ordinary. So that's how I'm going to test you know, whether you know, this is the limits test. Most of the time, I don't even need that because you know, if there is proof of you know, cheating in a test, I don't have to go through this test. I just say, OK, you know, I can show the dean that these two you know, answers are really the same, and they're extremely unlikely to be the same, and so stuff like that. Um, this is new, okay, so for those of you who have taken classes from me before, <coughs> this is new because I just want to explain why uh, academic integrity or honesty is so important. Okay, so let's just say that, you know, I just turn a blind eye and every professor turns a blind eye to cheating, okay? And cheating goes rampant, you know, on this campus, um, everybody gets good grades, okay? And they all transfer to Berkeley, right? What's going to happen over time? School is going to get shut down. So after they get to Berkeley, what is going to happen? For, for those people who really don't have the performance of an A student, maybe a C student, they will fail miserably, right? Do you think the Berkeley professors will notice that over a period of time that, you know, hey, people coming from AR, you know, have this tendency. They come in with, you know, GPAs that are really high, but they cannot perform. So over time, what do you think Berkeley is going to do? Exactly. Yep. And that will hurt not just the students who are cheating, but also all the other students who work really hard to get their good grades, right? And that is really that. I, I have something really against that. Okay. It's it is really unfair, and that's why you know I really you know want to make sure that uh, academic honesty is enforced. Okay, so are there any questions or comments about this part? No questions? Okay. 
<coughs> and the consequence part is also new, okay? Um, basically, if an activity is, you know, if there's cheating in a particular activity, that entire activity will get a zero. So if this is, let's say this is a midterm that has four questions, and I find that one question, the answer to one question shows, you know, um, basically, you know, without any doubt, you know, there's cheating involved, the entire midterm is going to get a zero, not just that one single question, okay? And repeated cases of cheating will be brought to the attention of the division dean. The division dean can then determine whether to forward the case to the disciplinary officer of the college. And when that happens, you know, really bad things can happen because it can lead to suspension and, you know, possibly expulsion. It depends on, you know, the you know, severity and, you know, many other circumstances, you know, but you know, really bad things can happen uh, if the dean and the disciplinary officer um, decides that there is, there's a need to kind of dish out this kind of consequences. Any questions about this part? Any questions? All right. Okay, student rights and responsibilities. Um, this is just something for your information. Um, this is a link, and if you have not clicked on this link before, then read about not just your responsibilities, but also as rights as, stu uh, rights as students. Go ahead and read it. It, it is going to be beneficial. Uh, classroom behavior expectations. Um, the bottom line is I just want the classroom, I mentioned this earlier as well, I just want to make sure the classroom is a safe place for everybody to, to learn um, and for me to teach and that's the bottom line, okay? So I don't want you know any type of uh, disruptive behavior. That doesn't count because it's an accident. <laughs> um, so, you know, I understand stuff happens, you know, like, you know, and it's okay. I mean, you know, little things, you know, do not, does not bother me. Um, chatting, okay, the first item is chatting, which is the most kind of, the most free, the most common disruptive, disruptive behavior. Um, and a lot of times it's not even because somebody is intentionally trying to disrupt the class or, you know, doing something that's unrelated to the class. It's like, oh, look at this Pokemon here. I've been, you know, this is what I caught today, right? Okay, most of the time it's related to the class. Most of the time it's just, you know, asking another student, like, okay, I kind of missed what he said, uh, you know, you know, like two, sen two sentences ago, you know, can you just, you know, show me your notes, okay? That's completely related to the class, but it's gonna be disruptive, okay? First of all, it's disruptive to the student that is being asked to answer the question, and then people around those two students will also be disrupted, okay? So in that particular case, you know, you can ask me, okay? You know, sometimes, most of the time, I'm kind of okay with explaining something again, um, except when people are late. <laughs> <laughs> I have had this one, one particular student who's not in this class right now, okay? And I'm not gonna name any names, uh, but he has a habit of coming to class really late. And then the first thing after he sits down, he sat down, is to ask me, so what did you talk about? <laughs> <laughs> and he knew that I was screen recording everything, including the voice. He knew that, okay? And I said, you know, well, you can just watch the video and find out later. And then he said, but that's gonna take me some time. It's gonna waste my time. I go like, yeah, but if I do it now, it's gonna waste the, the time of the entire class. <laughs> So, you know, that's you know, just you know, little things like that. Okay, so if you have any questions related to the class, just raise your hand and let me know, okay? Um, I am also known to go a little bit too fast sometimes. So, you know, if you feel that I'm going too fast, you cannot make connections between, you know, behind, between the concepts, it is not your problem, okay? Because I'm just going too fast. So ask questions, slow me down, let me use examples to illustrate those concepts. I'm pretty good at coming up with examples as needed to explain concepts, um, but I need to be asked, okay? Because I, I cannot gauge, you know, how much of the stuff you're understanding and how many holes is in my explanation. So you just need to give me some feedback, let me know, okay? <clears throat> 
uh, interrupting in the form of a question. So just raise your hand first, you know, because sometimes uh, several people have questions, and if they all just ask the questions at the same time, I cannot listen, I cannot, you know, interpret all of those questions. So raise your hand, and I can just, you know, address every single person. Okay, um, I have never, ever intentionally ignore a student and say, oh, that person is asking too many questions, I'm just going to ignore that student despite that student is raising their hand. I always make sure that nobody, you know, still has any questions before proceeding. Now, if you think that I have done otherwise, let me know because, you know, that definitely was not my intention. Right, George? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, George has taken a few classes from me, so he has more time to observe uh, whether that's true or not. Correct. Uh, mobile devices should be turned off or silenced during class. Okay, you know, I don't have a problem if you need to use a cell phone during class. Just make sure it's not disruptive. Okay, the bottom line is I don't want any type of anything that is disruptive to the class. But on the other hand, if you have something to do on the cell phone and you think you can still take the class and understand the concepts, hey, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not going to say anything about that, okay? All right, no eating or drinking in the classroom because there is a sign. Oh, it's back there, okay? Um, in a classroom like this, if you want to just bring, you know, plain drinking water, that's perfectly okay. Okay, because even if you spill, it's just plain water, it's going to dry up, doesn't leave a stain, no problem. Uh, on the other hand, your latte or vodka, you know, stuff like that, you know, that is not okay. Just put a cap on the cup, you know, and, and enjoy that after class. Okay, any questions? No questions, all right. Okay, questions are definitely welcome as long as they are related to this class, even remotely. Um, and ask in an orderly fashion, okay? Okay, how to attend classes, okay, lectures. Um, in this case, I usually do my screen recording, um, and I, I still haven't gotten the script to work correctly today, but I have the audio and the video part being recorded, and most of the time I encourage people to double check to make sure it is actually working. So I'm just double checking right now. The FLV, oh, that, that's, that's the, the, the failed attempt. So we are looking at um, the P3 310 stuff. Okay, so, the, so it, it's working, okay? The audio, the, the video portion is working, and then the audio portion is done by Audacity, and it's still being recorded, but it's not being converted into MP3, you know, it's not transcoded in real life, so that's why it's just being, it's just recording, but you don't see any file increase in size as it is recording it. Yep. Yeah. Where are we, where do we access this then? You go to YouTube, so you go to YouTube slash some profs, that's where I put all my videos. I will show you guys right here. So all you do is you go to YouTube. and type some props. Okay. That's the URL. <coughs> and then when you press the enter key, it will change the URL to youtube.com slash user says some props. That's okay. Um, so what you want to do is to go to the videos tab here. And it's going to show you all the videos in reversed chronological order, which means the most recent video is going to be listed first. And they all have names like this, uh, which is basically the date of the recording followed by the class code, because I do the same thing with all my classes. Is that, is that okay? Okay, excellent. All right, so getting back to the syllabus. So that's a really good um, segue because um, for the most part, unless I have a technical difficulty or forget to turn on the recorder, it's going to be recorded. So as long as you can make sure that I'm recording, um, you can focus on the discussion and not so much your busy copying stuff from the screen. Okay? So that's one thing that uh, many students have told me is, oh, they learned how to take classes from me because, you know, uh, because everything's getting recorded. So whatever I say, okay, whatever this microphone can record, sometimes including your questions and discussions, and whatever you can see on the projector is getting recorded. Okay, 
So don't copy, you know, the details, you know, the syntax of stuff, you know, the command, you know, you can actually see that again when you watch the video. So what you want to do is to make an index of the video itself. Okay, now today is kind of an exception because I really doubt how much content I can get into today. But let's say, you know, I'm currently starting on a new concept. Let's say we talk about a stack, okay? And it's 940. So what you want to do is you write on a piece of paper that you're going to keep and say, okay, 940 on this date, tax starts to talk about the stack. Okay, as simple as that. So in that case, if you need to review the video, and just say, okay, I want to hear again you know, and look at the screen, you know, how Tech explained the concept of a stack. You know exactly which video to go to, and you don't have to watch from the beginning. You can just fast forward to 40 minutes you know, past the, from the beginning, and you're pretty much you know, right at, at the right spot. Okay, so that's what you want to do. Second thing, okay, um, I can only record what I say and what's on the projector but I cannot record anything that you are thinking when you are listening to me. That is what you need to write down as well, okay? Because as you understand the concept, you are making a connection between that concept and other things that you already understand. So you might want to write that down because I cannot read your mind. <laughs> the recorder cannot read your mind and the screen cannot read your mind either. This is not a sidekick projector for those of you who watch Doctor Who. It's a gigantic uh, psychic paper, right? Mm. <laughs> so that's what you need to write down, okay? So me doing the recording doesn't mean that, you know, people do not have to bring a notebook or a pencil or anything to, you know, to take notes. It simply means that when you take notes, you're taking, some, you're taking notes of stuff that is not recorded on the screen. All right? Okay. Moving on to how to succeed in this class. Um, I'm not gonna go through this entire section, but you know, I do encourage you to read through it because I spent some time to talk about it. Um, with all my classes, not just this one, and I suspect it's true for most of the CISP classes, as well as your math classes and your science classes, it's all about understanding and the ability to apply the knowledge that you gain in a class. Okay, so let's, let's start with understanding. What is understanding? In the context of a class, okay? So what, let's say, you know, I say, okay, do you guys understand this particular concept, X, Y, and Z? Okay, what does it mean when somebody says, yes, I do understand the concept, yes? Having the ability to not only recite the facts involved, but actually identify them and use those facts on Right. Okay. So there are two. Uh, there, there are several aspects to understanding. The first one. Okay. Let's just take uh, the commutative law of algebra as an example. Okay. X plus x. X plus y equals y plus x. You can you know, transpose the ordering. Okay. Um, so the understanding part begins with. Okay. I get the idea. Okay. You know, the ordering is not important. If I change the order, it doesn't change the value, okay? And you can recite, you know, the, the, the rule itself, okay? Um, and then the other part is to associate that rule with something, some other things that you already understand, okay? Where the ordering is not important, a connection to something that you already understand. That's part of understanding. Um, so let's just say that you completely understand the law of, you know, uh, the commutative law how can I know that you understand that? If you can explain it back to you or teach someone else. Okay, so it really helps too. Yes, very good. Okay, that's a very good point. If you try to explain that to somebody else, it actually deepens your understanding of that concept. Yep. If you are able to relate said concept in other terms, uh, let's say comparing your math uh, anagram and commutative concept to uh, counting cows, Okay. It doesn't matter where the cows are standing, they all add up to the same sum. Okay. But how do I know that you understand the concept? Because that's how I need, that's what I need to grade, to give you a grade, right? So how can I tell? I cannot read your mind. You test us. I have to test, right? So in a test, how can I you know, check whether you guys understand the concepts or not? I cannot test whether you, whether you understand, but I can test whether you can apply the concept. So I can give you problems to solve, 
and the, the solving of those problems would involve the application of these concepts that I think you guys should understand. That is how I test you. Okay? So that's why in this class and in many other classes related to any type of STEM class, S-T-E-M, you know, STEM class, is going to be about the same. It's all about the application. Okay? It's not about whether you can memorize the equations in physics. Okay? It's not about whether you can memorize the symbols in chemistry. It's about you know, whether you can apply the knowledge okay, to solve problems. So in this class, it is a big thing. Okay? Problem solving is a big thing. Um, and it's going to be difficult for some people. It's going to be enjoyable to some other people. Um, but that's basically the bottom line of, you know, what I, this is what I can do to test with whether people understand concepts or not. Okay, but tech, you're just being, you know, just being a little bit too hard, you know, on your students, you know, because nobody actually needs to do this stuff at work. This is only for classes. <laughs> what do you do at work? I mean, how many of you plan to get a job eventually in computer science? Yeah. So I have about a third of a class planning to get jobs. Okay, I'm assuming the other two thirds either have really wealthy parents or you know, they already have a job, so they don't need to find a, a new job. Okay, <laughs> but what do you do as a software engineer, as a as a programmer? as a computer scientist. You solve problems, very good. So the very same skills that I am going to test you guys on with this class is gonna be the very same skill that you need as a developer, as a software engineer, as a computer scientist, as a, as a double E, okay? Electrical engineer, as a computer engineer, okay? Those are all jobs where you have to solve problems. Is that okay? All right, very good. This part, independence, is not really, this is, un, this is not related to cheating. It's about, um, are you going to solve the problems mostly by yourself, or are you going to ask for help, okay? Or when do you ask for help? That's the question. All right, so when you're stuck with the homework assignment, I'm reading from the third paragraph right here. Okay. okay, there will be times when you get stuck with an assignment, okay? It's by design, <laughs> okay? I will give you homework assignments that will basically stump you for a little bit, okay? Just so that you will have to spend the time to fully understand the concept in order to solve the problems, okay? And, you know, I usually I, I tell my students, in, especially in CISP 300, because none of those students have had me for as a professor, and I would tell them, if my homework assignments don't stump you even once, I'm not doing my job right. <laughs> Thanks for okay. the warning. But that philosophy applies to all of my classes. You know, I just like, you know, those kind of problems. You know, you just have to spend some time to work on it in order to solve the problems. Okay. So what do you do when you are quote unquote stumped? When you're stuck? Okay. Okay, it all depends on how long you have been working on the problem <coughs> before you say, okay, I'm stumped. Five minutes. <laughs> I'm stumped. I'm giving up. I'm going to ask. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours. So when do you say, okay, I am stumped to the point where and if I spend any more time, it's not going to be productive. Okay, go for it. Go ahead. I have other things to work on. Okay, you got other things to work on. Very good. Yep. When it's three in the morning and you don't know what to do. <laughs> okay. Funny thing that you said three a.m. Okay. So let me tell you a story about three a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. It's PG. Okay. I think it's G. G rated. Okay. When I was a grad student at UC Davis, okay, uh, my dissertation is mostly a long, huge proof of the properties of a solution to a particular problem. Okay? So I'm not even interested in how to solve the problem. I'm just saying that when you solve the problem, the solution has these properties mathematically. Okay? So it's one long math proof. And at one point, I had to prove uh, one particular theorem that I knew was actually important to me, and I spent Quite a few time, you know, quite a few days on it already, and you know, and at, at some point I just go like, okay, you know, if I spend any more time with my, uh, 
conscious mind on this problem is not going to be productive. So I just went ahead and do something else. You know, play badminton, watch Star Trek The Next Generation, have a lengthy discussion with my roommates about the story and everything else, and then I went to bed, you know, went to sleep. 3 a.m. in the morning, I awoke from a dream, and the proof was done <laughs> in my dream. I'm not kidding you, okay? You know, the, the concept, the steps that led to the proof was done in my dream. In other words, my subconscious mind had been working the whole time to solve the problem, okay? Even though I was watching TV, you know, playing badminton, doing other stuff, my, the, in the back of my mind, it was still working on the problem. You do okay? understand this only further uh, validates the mystique of I understand that, right? Like, I think everybody works the same way. <laughs> I really think so. I mean, you know, if you if you just give it enough time, you know, okay, I have to put it this way. My mind is a slow coker, okay? I'm not fast like some of the other professors. Okay? It's a slow coker. So I put all the ingredients in, okay, you close the lid and you turn the dial and just walk away. <laughs> so occasionally, like you know, a few times a day you get back and you look at the you you, you lift the lid and go like mm, and smell and go like yeah, I think I can use a little bit more spice. You get up to the backyard and get some uh, um, basil or something else. You just put it in, you know, taste it. Ah, can use a little more salt, you know, sprinkle a little more. Close the lid and just walk away again. Okay? So it's not like you're not putting any effort into it. You have to put in the effort by preparing the ingredients. Okay? So I'm not saying you guys don't have to spend any time and the solution will just come to you. You do have to make sure that you have the right ingredients. When you're working on a homework assignment, what are your ingredients? Yeah, no problem. I was about to say, yeah, the problem, exactly. Okay, so you have to understand what the assignment is asking you to accomplish in the first place. Okay, you have to understand the concepts that you need to understand to get it done. Okay, so there, those, the preparation of the ingredients does take effort. It, that's that's where the work is. Okay, so once you have all the right ingredients, you say, okay, I think I got the understanding of this. I think I understand what the assignment is asking me to do. Blah 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 blah. Then you just put everything in the pot, which basically means, okay, I'm gonna work on this a little bit, 15 minutes, half an hour or so. Okay, and you say, okay, I still cannot come up with a solution. Then you just walk away, but not giving up. You're basically just letting your, the subconscious of your mind to work on the problem for a little bit, and then maybe six, uh, seven hours later, you come back to the problem, and you go like, okay, let me take a second look at this problem. And possibly you would have made, made some progress, okay? Or possibly you might realize at that point and go like, okay, I cannot solve this problem, but that's because I did not really understand what that means, okay? One of the concepts involved in the homework assignment. Then you can go back, and you know, work on that you know, a little bit, listen to the lecture again, read the notes again, go onto the internet, do a little search, okay, just to make sure that you understand. You're, you're basically making sure that your ingredients are correct in the first place. Okay? So that's what this whole slide is about, is basically you know, don't give up too soon and ask someone. Because when you ask someone, it's the same thing as, okay, so let's say you're trying to make something that's really, really nice in a crock pot. Okay, um, it's a slow cooker. Okay, so 30 minutes into cooking that thing, you open the lid and it's like, that doesn't look like real, really good food to me. And then what do you do? You went out to McDonald's, <laughs> <laughs> and you get a hamburger. So that's basically what it is. You know, when when people give up a little bit too soon and ask someone for the answer. Okay, uh, it's 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 not. You're not going to get the benefits by you know, from uh, asking too soon, so l give it a little more time. But the other part of this part of this thing is you have to start early. Most of the homework assignments, I wouldn't say all, but most of the homework assignment you have a week to work on it. Okay, from the time I give you the homework assignment to the time that you have to turn in the homework assignment, you have one week. Some assignments may have two weeks, okay, but one week is kind of the minimum. So what you want to do is to start on it as soon as possible. Get the slow cooker starting early, okay? Because that will give you time to review the material, it will give you time to slow cook stuff, and it will also give you time when you're really stumped 
to ask questions. And do not be surprised when I answer your question with another question. Right, George? Yep. <clears throat> I, I do that you know, regularly because, not because I don't you know, intentionally want to make it painful for other people, but I think you know, if I ask a question to guide the person to get to the actual answer, that will help that person instead of just saying, okay, here's, you know, here's the answer. Okay? All right? Is that everything okay so far? Okay. okay. I don't see anyone running out of the classroom right now, so that's a good sign. And oh, studying before class is always helpful. Okay, grading standard. This is uh, the same stuff as I usually have, but I now use a table to look at A, B, C, D, F, and what does it mean to get an A, B, C, D, and F? I know the first part is really boring, so we'll start with the last one, which is product evaluation. An A is basically the same thing as something that has a five-star rating at Amazon, okay? So when do you, you give a product review and say, okay, this is a five-star product, out of five-star out of five? What makes a product a five-star out of five product? It's, it's your no flaws. <laughs> no flaws. It does exactly what you want it to and possibly then some. And then some, okay? It, it surprised you. It's like. The, the product said it will survive a three foot drop onto concrete, and you drop it on a ladder by 10 feet and it survives just fine. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, it surprised you, right? You know, it's so good that you, know, you just did not expect it to be, to be that good. Okay? Good for the price, too. Hmm? It's gotta be good for the price, too. Good for the price, okay? You know, so relative to the price, you, know, you are surprised or impressed by the quality of the product. And most likely, you, know, you would highly recommend this product to your friends. Okay, it's like, oh, go buy this. You know, this is really, really good stuff. Okay, a four star is one star. You, you take away one star, right? What would make you take away one star and make it a four star product instead of a five star product? Cost too much. Hmm? Cost too much. It takes too long to get to my house. Say again. Cost too much. Your delivery time is too long. Okay, so that's probably that's delivery issues. Okay, but as far as the product itself is concerned, what would make you take it one star away? Minor flaws that don't take away from the product, but okay. they don't make it the best it could be. Could be better, but it does work as advertised. Yeah. Right? You know, so when you're talking about, let's say, a USB portable charger, because people need that for Pokemon Go these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when, when you buy a, uh, you know, uh, let's say, 10,000 milliamp hour you know, portable charger, you, a four-star product would be one that kind of gives you at least 10,000 as advertised, right? Um, the finish is nice, everything is good as advertised, you know, the picture, you know, exactly, exactly the product. But there are little things they just don't really like that much about the product, okay? It can be the positioning of the USB ports, okay? You know, you might want to have those spaced out a little more or something like that, okay? It's just little things that you go like, well, it could be a little bit better. But it's not wrong, okay? It's just, yeah, it could be a little, it could be improved. Uh, it, and you would still recommend that product to other people. It's like, well, it's not perfect, but it's still a good product. A three star product is kind of like meh, okay, right? It's kind of like acceptable, you know, 10,000 milliamp hour is 10,000 milliamp hour, but there's nothing else that impresses me at all with this product, okay? It's meh, kind of mediocre in terms of execution. Um, it's unlikely that you want to go for a refund, okay? You're just going like, well, there's really nothing too impressive. It does work, period, okay? Um, you may not recommend a three-star product to your friends, okay? It's because it doesn't impress you in the first place. A two-star product is something that is subpar, which means it doesn't really quite perform as advertised. If the advertisement says it's a 10,000 milliamp hour, you know, uh, battery pack, you test it and it turns out to be like 7,000, maybe 8,000. It, it falls short of what you expect the product to be able to do, okay? One star means it doesn't work at all, okay? You get a charger, you spend the whole night charging it. The next day, you try to charge it when your Pokemon Go is sucking all the juice off your cell phone, and you plug in and go like, hey, it's not even charging the phone. What's going on, okay? It doesn't work at all. That's a, that's a one star product. Now, I don't understand why they don't go for zero star to four stars, 
because a lot of people say, you know, if I can give it zero stars, I won't give it any stars. Okay, so but but that's how you rate products, and that's basically how I evaluate your answers to your homework assignments and also the questions in the exams. Okay, so I basically use exactly the same scale to evaluate everything that you turn in. This one is kind of funny too, you know, job evaluation. So for the one third of the class that raised their hand and said, yes, I think eventually I'll get a job, this may be, <laughs> this may interest you as well. Okay, a five star employee is one, is, uh, is the kind of employee where a company will say, oh, I'm going to give you a raise. You did not even ask for a raise, okay? In the job, in, in the evaluation, your boss just says, okay, I'm giving you a raise and your title is now, you know, a, a little bit higher than what it used to be because they want to make sure you do not leave. You are uh, working, you are so beneficial to the company that they feel that, you know, okay, you know, if we were to lose this employee, we'll be losing a lot of money. So we, it's better just to, give this person a raise to keep this person with this company. That's a five-star employee. A four-star employee is still a very good employee, but not to the point where the employer says, you know, I'm gonna give you a raise automatically, okay? If you ask for one, they might give you one, but if you don't ask, then it, no one's gonna actively give you a raise. A, a three-star employee is one who is just breaking even, okay? Compared to the salary, the benefits, the company is just kind of breaking even. It's like, well, if we can find someone better, you'll be fired. <laughs> but before we do, before we find somebody better, we'll keep you. Um, a four, a two-star employee, or you know, this uh, second uh, column to the right-hand side, is someone who's doing, uh, performing poorly, who's likely to be fired. Okay. Um, and a one-star employee is someone who did not go to work at all. <laughs> so nothing was done, or when that person does go to work, it, he or she does more damage, okay? So the company says, nope, <laughs> you're not coming back to work. <laughs> All right, so that's basically how I evaluate, you know, how I assign A, B, C, D, F in this class. So in terms of scores, I am just going to do exactly the same thing, okay? Um, Oh, this is bad. I just got it reversed, didn't I? I got it all reversed. Oh, that would be bad, huh? At least we understand. The funny thing is, yesterday, after two classes, nobody noticed, but nobody said anything about it. <laughs> okay, but an F, okay, so this is like reversed. Okay, so an A student is a 4.0, and in terms of percentage of the score, anyone who gets at least 87.5% is getting an A in this class. The next one is 62.5%, which is a 3.0 in terms of GPA, and so I'll just kind of read it backwards, okay? <laughs> that would be a really, really bad uh, grading scale. <laughs> you do all that the time, and then you're being good, and then you're like, but I'm gonna fail you, it's exceptional. Okay, so what do I do to, uh, to assess, you know, and you know, to get all the points so that, I, so that I can give you a grade at the end of this whole semester? Assignments only make up 20% of your final grade. Now, even though it only makes up 20%, it is very important, okay? Because this is where you practice stuff, okay? And if you uh, do a homework assignment, it doesn't work. Um, I would actually give you all the uh, answers, you know, after the due date. So this is really good exercise, okay? At, at least for you to assess yourself and say, okay, do I understand the concepts, okay? If you can go through a homework assignment and go really fast and it's perfectly done, you probably have a good understanding of the underlying concepts. On the other hand, if it takes you a little bit longer, you know, then you might want to study a little bit more or at least, you know, clarify the concepts because, you know, that's what's making a homework assignment slow. I do not tend to make homework assignments that only has busy work. In fact, I hate busy work myself. So I don't want you guys to do busy work either, okay? So all of the homework assignments is not gonna have a lot, you won't spend a lot of time if you understand the concepts. I'm not gonna give, give you guys like a 20 page description of a, of a computer program that is supposed to do something that's semi-realistic, okay? I'll give you something that can be done within 20 lines of code, 40 lines of code at the most. 
But to come up with those 40 lines of code require that you understand all of the concepts thoroughly. Okay, that's the kind of homework assignment that I give out in this class. But to do the homework assignment is studying. Okay, that is how you study for this class is to do the homework assignment. All right, exams, there are three exams. The first and second exams are midterms. Each one is going to make up 20% of your final grade. And then the final exam by itself is 40% of your final grade, which is kind of heavy. But at the same time, the final exam really tests whether you can put everything together. And that's why it has a higher percentage. So yep. The final exam is comprehensive? The final exam is, sometimes it is. But for this class, you know, there are certain concepts that I really don't have time to test in the final exam. For the most part, you know, for classes like this, the concepts are, they, they always stack up. So it's really hard not to be comprehensive. Yeah. It's just that you know, I may not ask any questions explicitly to test whether you understand the earlier concepts or not. But the fact that you understand a later concept means that you have to understand the earlier ones. All right, we're almost done here. This is a tentative schedule of this class. Um, and topics actually have changed. I need to re I need to update this part here because the, the concepts of the uh, the topics have changed a little bit. All right. So, are there any questions before we spend the next ten minutes or so on actual topics? The lab portion of this class is gonna is gonna be me demonstrating the the use of several tools. Uh, including uh, the assembler and also the uh, logic sim, which is a, uh, a simulator. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time in the lab doing that today. Um, but the next for the next ten minutes, we are actually going to dig into the class material and start with. Um, are we switching classrooms? Yes, we are. Um, the lab of this class is in which room? On twenty-eight. On twenty-eight. On 28? Okay. All right. So the first you know, section here, this is all the reading material. They're all linked from um, in Moodle. Um, so what I do want you to do is to I'm just looking at this and find out, you know, try to find out which way to start first. Um, serious hacking is really just um, one interesting reason to kind of take this class. It's about you know hacking. Okay, it's about you know making a program do what it is not supposed to. Okay, and you might say, well, you know, how does that relate to assembly language programming? When you get an executable, you know, which is the file that contains the code for the computer to run. It is usually in object code already, unless the, the programming language is interpreted. So given that, okay, how can you make this program? How can you break a program? So for instance, I'll give you an example. For instance, let's say you have a program where it you know, requires you to authenticate, to input a username and a password, and if it doesn't match, it won't let you proceed to the useful part of the program. Is that okay? And you have the executable. Taking this class gives you the basic knowledge to do some simple hacking where you can say, okay, you know, if the program is not written correctly, like it has string copy and stuff like that, you can potentially break the program by feeding it you know, very well-crafted usernames and or passwords so that the program will let you proceed anyway, even though you don't really have the right password. Okay, so that's, that's hacking, okay? Um, why do you think hacking may be something that you should pay attention to? Because if you don't know how it's done, then how can you stop somebody from doing it? Okay, and go ahead. To protect the software that you write. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching you guys, you know, sometimes I will teach you how to hack. <coughs> Not so that you guys can hack, but you can also understand how to write programs that cannot be hacked, at least not easily. Okay. So you know, this is one you know, kind of interesting thing that you can do. Um, and this is a hyperlink to um, another website. Um, this guy, you know, Sam, um, I guess Sam, Sam Bone, okay? 
He is a professor at CCSF, the City College of San Francisco. And I have gone to a few workshops that he uh, taught uh, at various occasions, and he's really, really good. And this book, you know, the Shell Coders Handbook, is also a really good book if you want to understand, you know, hacking. How do you make a program do what it is not supposed to? You know, what kind of loophole exists in common type of coding? It's a great resource, okay? I'm not gonna get into this in this class because that's not the focus of this particular class. But, you know, what I teach does relate to hacking, okay? Uh, you do not need to understand the material of this class to become a good hacker. So what we'll do is we're gonna start with uh, low level mechanisms and representation. Um, because this class is pretty much as low level as it gets when it comes to computer science. So here we have the oldest type of mechanism for mm -hmm. a electronic uh, computer. It is called a, a vacuum tube. Okay, yeah, it's a vacuum tube, which is you know the, the oldest component uh, for electronic computers. Okay, it's not mechanical. They do have mechanical computers before this, but those are really clunky. You know, this is the, you know, basically the first device that is not mechanical that people use in computers. Vacuum tubes were used in the 1920s, okay? And they are the main ingredients of the uh, Colossus as well as the Endiac computer. Uh, one of these is uh, used in, at the end of World War II to decode German encrypted messages. Which one is that? I think it's the Colossus. Colossus. Yeah. 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 Yep. And Turing was uh, part of the, uh, the team as well to design the, uh, the thing. Okay. So after that, you know, people uh, discovered semiconductors, and then they started to have transistors. So transistors were first used in 1953 to make a computer, as components to make a computer. And you can see, you know, the components you know, can be big, can be small, and they get to progressively they got smaller and smaller. Okay, to the point where uh, they can put multiple transistors onto one single die. So physically, it's just one thing, but on that one thing, there were many, many transistors. So those are what we call integrated circuits or ICs. Okay, and those were first introduced in 1963. Okay. And then after that, we only use ICs in computers. And this is a picture, you, know, you probably cannot read this, um, but let me see if I can at least kind of spell. It's Moore's Law, right? Yeah. And if you look at the scale, the bottom or the horizontal scale is time. From 1971, it doesn't even go back to the vacuum tubes. And then the vertical scale is the number of transistors uh, on each chip, okay? One thing you might notice is the time is linear, okay? So the spacing is about 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, 11 years. But approximately each mark is only about 10 years. But when you look at the vertical scale, it is not linear. What is it? It's exponential, okay? But when you look at the, the line that was that is plotted here, it looks linear to you, right? Which basically means the number of transistors per chip is growing at an exponential you know, uh, curve. Yep, well at least up to you know, this point, it is still exponential. Okay? There were many times, okay, you know, I can tell you, in the 80s, in the 90s, and you know, the, uh, the 2000s, there were many times when people think, oh, okay, I think we have hit the limit. We can no longer <laughs> keep this going anymore. And every single time, because of commercial reasons, because of profits, Profitability, Intel and AMD, they push each other to say, okay, we can do better than this. Okay, and every single time, <laughs> they found a way to pack more stuff, to, mac to pack more transistors onto these ICs, okay? And when you look at this picture, and if I were to plot, let's say, uh, the progress of jet engines, okay? What do you think you know, the performance of jet engine has improved? over time since the world at the end of the World War II. Probably, you know, there were some progress, right? Okay. So maybe five fold, six fold in terms of fuel efficiency and thrust, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. Maybe tenfold at the most. 
Okay, I don't think <coughs> we have exceeded like tenfold compared to the old, you know, jet engine designs. But computers have gone how much? How many times? <laughs> <laughs> exponential. Exponential. Okay. Now it is. It's really, really important that you know computers make this kind of progress because if you think about it, what if you know there were no advances in terms of avionics since World War One? So we are, we'll still be flying biplanes and stuff like that. But computers have advanced you know the same at the same rate. We will still have drones. Except the drones won't be so sleek and having quad you know, chopper and stuff like that. They'll be biplanes, but they will still be drones. Okay, but the reverse is not true. Okay, even if jet engines were to advance like you know, at twenty times. Okay, the current jet engines are twenty times as good as the jet engines at the end of World War II. But computers never made any progress. Will can we still have drones? No. Exactly. Okay. Because even the B-52 is not enough to house a single computer, let alone the power supply for that computer as well. As well. So that really kind of tells you why computer technology is so pivotal, not only just for the sake of computers, but also you know, in many, many other areas. Is that making any sense? And that trend is still continuing. So what that means is the progress is going faster and faster and faster. So in 20 years, what, what will computers look like in 20 years? I can tell you I have no idea. Okay, What can we possibly do with computers in 20 years? I have no idea. But I can tell you with airplanes in 20 years, they will still be about the same. They may be faster, they can fly higher, maybe more quiet and stuff like that but it will still be kind of like what we have today, okay, in 20 years, okay? So let me just take a look at the time. We still have two more minutes, so we'll continue a little bit here. Okay, a transistor, a vacuum tube, they're basically just valves, okay? In other words, when you look at the valve, okay, this is a typical valve that you can buy at a store. It looks like this, right? Okay, it's simplified. There's a control here. You can turn the thing, and either you shut off the flow or you allow you know things to flow through it. That's a valve. Okay. So what is different about the valves that we use in computers is only one thing. The very same thing that, that it controls the the same the stuff that is flowing through is also the kind of stuff that can either actuate or deactuate the the valve itself. That's the only thing. Okay. Just imagine. A, a switch for the lights. Okay, so a, a, a typical switch is actuated by you. Okay, you have to flip it up and down to turn it on and off. So it doesn't fit that description, but a relay does because a relay takes electrical input to turn on and off another electrical contact. So yes, you can use relays to make computers because it fits that description. There are two kinds of valves, okay, you know, we call it high side and low side. But the bottom line is when you look at this particular picture or circuit here, I'm just trying to fit the entire picture into the projector. Okay. Like this. Okay. We are, we just ran out of time, but I, I still want to present this picture here. This picture has four transistors, okay? In other words, there are four valves here. One, two, three, four, okay? And the way they work is a little bit different. These two are of the same type, these two are of the same type, okay? Um, and then you have two input signals. This one goes to this particular valve, but it also goes to this particular valve. This one goes to this valve, and it also goes to this other valve well, down here, okay? Four transistors, two input, one single output, the top here is called VCC. It's just a supply voltage. You know, it's like 5 volt, 3 volt, 3, depending on the chip that you have. And this is ground, which is the same thing as zero volts. Okay. So the bottom line here is, um, what kind of combination of T1 and T2 will give you an output at T3? What kind of output is going to be at T3, depending on what kind of input you're getting from T1 and T2? Okay. So. As a quote unquote reading homework assignment, I just want you to take a look at this picture, read the description of the transistors, 
and see if it, you can figure it out. Okay, and now there's one hint here. T1 and T2 can either be a low voltage, which is gravel, or can be a high voltage, which is VCC. So we don't, we don't look at you know, the voltages in between, it's just a zero and one. And T3 can either be connected to ground through the transistors, or it can be connected to VCC through these two transistors. So I just want you to make a truth table, okay? Map it out and say, okay, what if T1 is low, T2 is low, what is the output? If T1 is high, T2 is low, what is the output? Just make a truth table, four rows, okay? To see if you can see what this particular circuit is going to do. So that's kind of your reading assignment for uh, Thursday. And in about 10 minutes, uh, we are going over to 128. And I'll show you some of the tools that we use in this class, uh, just so that you can, you can start to get used to it. Thank <laughs> you.